Welcome to Broadcast. Kim is spitting out her gum. I'm sorry, classy lady. <laughs> so um, we are uh, here for the week, <laughs> for the hour. I'm so very excited because we have your personal friend oh, and mm -hmm. strong, smart, kick butt woman. Broad. Broad. Yeah. Robin Sachs in the house. Woo -woo. Hello. So I'd pull the mic here. close to your face because they're very sensitive, and so if you're not like making out with it, it doesn't work. Sadly, <laughs> we um, do that in the second hour of the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. if all goes well. So um, you sent me an article this a post this week uh, me being that me you Kim yeah. uh, that men are intimidated by smart women. It's a new thing. It's, it's, it's a, a new, new thing. thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sorry, that's been the exactly. basis of my dating existence. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's what's funny about it is that a survey has come out or some sort of study or it doesn't even matter because right. that, met, that has, has proven once and for all that men are intimidated by smart women. Or if they're not intimidated, then they want you to be their mother and <laughs> then you have to mother them and those are the ones that aren't intimidated. So when you get that choice... Uh, it's the choice of intimidation or completely needy. Right. And well, there you go. Seems. Ladies and gentlemen. No, <laughs> but, but I'm not a hater. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Are I you don't. single? I have a very serious boyfriend. Oh, okay. So Happily right. boyfriends and, not, <laughs> and going through a divorce. Okay. But between, and you don't have to share anything you don't want to, but between your, your marriage and your new partner, did you date a lot and did you find that people were intimidated because you happen to be an incredibly smart, articulate, well-known public figure do you think that people were intimidated by you I think people either like like me or they completely hate me it's there's kind of no in between it seems like there's people who can kind of connect with strong people and I'm also sarcastic and I think I'm really funny and I think that my humor gets gets in the way too yeah but but I do think that people generally men generally have um, if they're not kind of women loving people in their soul then they would be generally intimidated hmm I mean, I think that we as women, though, should respond to this and really dumb ourselves down, don't you? Okay, I'm sorry. I tried to be funny. <laughs> I can't even do it. My PSA is, who cares? I mean, who cares? Why would you ever change well, who you are for somebody else? Well, first of all, the, ar the article was a little bizarre because they, they, they surveyed 105 men and they, they didn't put women in front of them. They gave them scenarios and they told them to read the scenarios, but envision someone, a woman in your life. So who are they pulling from that they're now creating a, a scenario that involves someone that they already know and then they're trying to apply that logic to this ridiculous survey in my opinion, I thought mm -hmm. it was a little silly. And they said, you know, imagine that a woman that you are attracted to suddenly tells you that she, you know, is a, pro a, a prodigy. Do you feel attracted to her again? Like, it was just, just a weird kind of vague survey in and of itself. But right. I, well, and 105 know. people I don't think is exactly representative <laughs> yeah. of the population. Yeah. You know, I mean, 105 people may be representative of, like, you know, the gym or something. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, where do they go uh -huh. to get them? Like, the guys are drinking. and. But, but there was someone that posted on our Facebook page um, that said... That he uh, he's always been known to date highly intelligent women because he thinks it's hot and it's creative. He said, but they're the first ones to call him out the quickest on his BS. And so I took from that that he doesn't stay because who wants to be called out on their BS as much? Well, and there's so many different types of women, just like there's so many different types of men. So I don't know that you can necessarily have a conversation without saying, what kind of woman are you? Because there are some women who are... Uh, very girly, if you will, and and prefer to do kind of the stereotypical girl women things, want to be a mom, want to stay at home, want to cook. That's not me. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and so a person who may be attracted to that would not be attracted to me, but at the same time, I'm still a woman, but I happen to be a woman that likes to work and drive out there. Right. And, and she may be just equally as smart, but she just took a different path. Exactly. You know, so... Yeah. So should we just call know. BS on the whole thing? I, I, it is my theory <laughs> that, that I, I have either I've dated uh, schmucks in my life or I've dated people that have been intimidated by my experiences and my intelligence and my drive. So I don't know which it is. I, I, I am the, the, the single unified thread between all those people, obviously, so <laughs> I have to take some ownership about who I am. But I do believe that men have been intimidated by my experiences and my successes. And it usually comes up when men don't ask about my job. They don't ask about my advocacy work. They don't really inquire too much beyond my day-to-day -day, like family stuff mm. to know too much about my professional life. And so that's usually where I'm like, oh, maybe this person's a little uncomfortable with 
me being kind of a ball buster. But I, I have a corollary to this whole thing that I find particularly troubling, which is how mean women are to other women. Like yeah. there's guys right. and, and intimidation and, and what have you. And, and potentially that's workable. Like being intimidated, that's their own insecurity. That's their own junk on their side that they need to work through. But it's the, the, the claim that there's a sisterhood and women are going to help other women. But really, I find that women are the first to stick the knife in your back, the first to turn it, the first to be happy to see you fail, the the more t likely to be jealous. Some women, not, some women. Not some, I yeah. mean, yes, definitely everything is, is some, but in the professional world, mm -hmm. when you're amongst similarly minded people, I do find that women, they say into your face, they there's this feeling of kumbaya and we want to all support each other. But the first moment that a, a you know, that you, they have an opportunity, they'll be the first ones to, mm. you know, take your job, take your boyfriend, uh, Take your nanny from the park. I mean, <laughs> I, those, you know, they're there. Right. Sleep with your best friend's husband. Ladies, there's enough abundance to go around. We don't have to fight each other for it. Let's just, you know, anyway. <laughs> so we, uh, just if you're tuning in, uh, Robin Sachs is with us here this morning. She is um, uh, a nationally recognized litigator in both criminal law and family law. And uh, I've met Robin a long time ago um, through media stuff, but also because you're a staunch advocate for victims' rights and for sexual assault um, victims and child abuse cases. And so I'm just glad that you came to join us today. But just in case people are just tuning in, we didn't want to forget to tell them who you are. Well, thank Very you for good. having me. I love sure. being good. here. Hey, I think so, it's also um, cool over here. In New Hall, by the way. Just let me just give a shout out to New Hall. Yes. Like it's kind of like happening over here. It's a really quaint little town. They've been, they've like been I can building rock it. This town. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like it's it. fun. It's fun. So, um, all right. So there are two words. Oop! Don't look. Ah, sorry, Peter. Okay. There are two words that um, a new study says are the secret to a happy marriage. What two words do you think they are? Sex. <laughs> Sex. <laughs> That's Sex one word. And dinner. <laughs> no, the two words that you would say to another person. Oh. Uh I know the answer to this. You do? I do because I saw that I saw the story. Oh, you did? Thank I purposely you. didn't send it to you. Is that thank you? Is it thank it you? It is thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. And so they're saying that, you know, gratitude um and the in the words thank you could be the secret to a happy relationship. What do you guys what do you ladies broads think of that? To the two divorced women in the room. Mm, sorry. <laughs> well, uh, listen, I'm I'm happily when divorced. Divorce I, I, I I'm happily you're like too. thank you. Yeah, I'm but, divorced. But, but a shout out to my ex-husband. He's like, first of all, he lives around the block from me, and mm -hmm. he, you know, we co-parent very well. Mm -hmm. I call him for advice. We have a very good relationship. Terrible husband. Great dad. Good friend. Wonderful lawyer. So yeah. I'm happily divorced in that yeah. way. Yeah. But I think that there's a feeling in marriage that a feeling of needing to be understood. And I think that's where the thank you comes from, which is if you feel like the person has empathy for where you are, what you're going through, and you just want someone to understand and get you, then that would naturally parlay into saying things like thank you. Right. I just think gratitude as a whole, like to, to feel valued is so important, you know? And at first I was like, oh, is it, I'm sorry, you know, or any of that. But like, I like that it's something positive. Um, for example, this morning, we've had a, a, one of our kids has been sick off and on for almost a couple of months now. And so we've really had to shuffle and do things. And my daughter had something at school this morning. And while both of us were going to go, all of a sudden only one of us could go because the other one had to stay home. I mean, it's a story that we've all, <laughs> we all can relate, you know. But um, my husband then said, well, go to your radio show and I'll call and I'll tell work that I'll be there at noon, you know. And so just... It wasn't even a question for him that this is a priority for me. This is something that's, you know, important. And so he went to my daughter's school. He came back, replaced me with the other child, and I'm here. And so to my husband, I say, thank you. Shout out to Mr. Jackie. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think, though, in general, that we don't he's say thank you. And he's fine with being called that. Yeah. He was called Mr. Morgan on our uh, honeymoon because I had booked it. Uh, and so we had just gotten married. I just became MacDougal. And he was like, and they were like, hello, Mr. Morgan. He's like, I'm just going to get used to that. <laughs> well, so no, my last name, my married last name, I still have because I haven't finalized my divorce yet. And so on my passport and, and on all my travel stuff, it's my married name. And the worst is when my boyfriend and I go somewhere and they call him <laughs> oh, my oh. husband's last name and it's really bad. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, that's much he worse. Does, he doesn't like that. Like, uh, <laughs> that that does not that go That happened well. to me man, hundreds of times. Um, but I think in general, you know, saying thank you is a, is a lost art overall. I think mm -hmm. that we were... I found this the other day. I was having lunch with someone, and this woman had come into lunch, and she just gotten her hair done. And the whole table was like, "Wow, your hair looks great!" And immediately she says, "Wow, this was happened, and that happened, and didn't do this, and it didn't do that." And I said, "Say thank you." Like we right. don't stop 
and acknowledge that someone's validating. We don't stop and acknowledge that someone's being gracious or someone's being kind and that someone actually might be wanting to pay you a compliment. But you know what I look at that woman is, is that she can't even take, the, the sadder part is she can't even take it in as a compliment. Yeah. So she doesn't even think to say thank you because she can't just take in the, the compliment. Do you think it's more hot? You have to be taught how to take a compliment. And I think when we're young girls and, you know, we're taught so much, you know, like to push the attention off of our, 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 ourselves, you know what I mean? So I just, I feel like we're taught not to say thank you. No, I actually think the opposite. I think we're taught to say thank you so much that it doesn't hold meaning I well, mean, I th- every time you walk around a kid, say thank you, make sure you say thank you, say thank you, say thank you. But as you get older, the insecurities mm. start to settle, the, the questions, the, the lack think, of yeah. confidence. But if you're saying thank you, it's all, people, I think, believe in that that's them saying, then I agree with what you're right. saying, and therefore I am being a pompous, I egotistical just say person. <laughs> yeah. I say on fleek. Yeah. <laughs> Two words yeah. I'll probably never say. Uh, <laughs> I just I find that I'm, I'm, I'm cool trying enough. to say Neither thank you more. Yeah. I'm trying to, to take a- acknowledgement one way or the other and just be gracious, and it's really hard. It's, but you're just, right, though. Hard. We say thank you. I think we overthink sometimes for stuff that, and then we don't say thank you when it, they're the the genuine words we want to share. Like even on your your email, your signature what do, what do says I say? thank you, Kim uh, Goldman. Oh. Like it's already there. Oh. So sometimes I'm like, yeah, I'll see you oh, so there, you, and yeah. it's like thanks, Kim Goldman. Yeah, like, <laughs> every time. <laughs> well, I don't want to be rude. But what about what about <laughs> sorry? That's the other one that's overused. Like uh, you know, sorry, yes. where it's not a meaningful apology. That that's just as bad. Do you think women say I'm sorry more than men do? Like like yeah, like, I think. I mean, have you ever noticed like. I play tennis, so every time you know I play with someone, I find myself when I miss a ball, I'm like, "Sorry." I'm like, "Why am I saying sorry? I missed the ball." I <laughs> do you hear, did the men say sorry. they're sorry? No, I don't think they do. Sorry, no. I missed the ball. Sorry, I missed the serve. Like, and my huh? daughter does it. She's, yeah. you know, she, I'll say, "Do you want um, Cheerios or Rice Krispies?" And she's like, "I think Cheerios." I'm sorry, you know, and I'm like, "Why are you saying sorry?" And then later on, I'm giving her something, and she's like, "No, I asked for." Oh, I'm sorry, you know, and I'm doing the same thing back to her. So I'm yeah. trying to model appropriately you know yeah that's a hard but we one. do you i mean you and i have done that where one of us says something and the other one's already like defensive about it jackie and, and i's our, our conversations are mostly apologizing to each other <laughs> it literally it's the funniest and then apologizing thing. for apologizing yeah. and then we really need to stop doing that i'm so sorry and they're like just stop with the sorry we're really trying to help each other and i don't i well, think words i mean that's the thing by the way we use so few of them now with texting and by the way i just got that like bitmoji thing where you i like, love oh, bitmoji <laughs> it's really so now i don't yeah. even have to like type in words i can just send pictures mm-hmm. but it, but it, because of that, I the think ones with your are, own character. Yes, yeah. Oh my gosh, they're the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah with the word. Yeah, like that. I did work today. I, I'm like obsessed with them. I sent it to my daughter today. I'm like, feel so cool. But I too hear my son starting to apologize for things, and it it hurts, you know, because I'm thinking, why is he apo- is he truly apologetic for something that he thinks he's done and he's ashamed of, or needs, you know, a hug or has remorse over, or is it just oh, I'm sorry I didn't please you. I'm sorry I didn't accommodate you. I'm sorry I didn't, you know, I is right. it a nervous? I'm sorry. I don't. Right. I don't know. What about not saying? what you need you know so we sit here and say all these throwaway lines like sorry and thank you but when you need something from someone so often we're not saying you know what i'm feeling really bad today i need you to do a and those words somehow don't happen Mm -hmm. Um, and when you can express yourself that allows for intimacy which allows people to be closer which allows people to get along better you know i i often bring it up um in my other life when we're not breaking the internet here on broadcast. Um, I counsel kids. And one of the things that I always am teaching my staff and my kids about is there's always an opportunity to teach a kid how to communicate. And so we always come from strength-based positions and telling, ex- teaching kids how to express their needs and their wants and having it not be a selfish thing. And all of our kids will say, well, it sounds so selfish. I'm like, sometimes it's okay to be selfish. Selfish has such a negative connotation. Mm-hmm. But I think if we can learn how to be selfish, because it means putting ourselves first so that we can be the best humans we can, not at the expense of somebody else, right. but because we need to take care of us so that we can be better humans for others. And that sometimes starts with, I need quiet. I need help. I need you know support. I need a hug or whatever it is. And we're not taught I, I certainly wasn't taught we are to do taught that. in one place i'll tell you where we're taught that on an airplane uh, when you get on an airplane and they do that whole thing of put the mask on yourself first <laughs> right. and then you can help someone else mm-hmm. that is the only time we are taught that right everywhere else we're taught about putting other people first but the airlines 
doing something right. But you know what's interesting is uh-huh. I, I grew up, you know, where if somebody w- had a certain behavior or whether it was myself or someone else in the community, it's like, oh, she's just doing that for attention. And it was so funny, like getting attention was a bad thing. It was, I mean, it was constantly said, oh, you're just trying to get attention. You right. know, and you're it's like, well, wait a minute, out. I'm the 11th child. <laughs> of course I am, first of all. But secondly, that's one of those needs that we're born with. You know, there are certain basic needs, food, water, shelter, you know, but that love and attention is actually a basic human need. And I think when somebody on Facebook even will put so, and people are annoying, we all know this on Facebook, but other people are like, oh, that person's just trying to get attention. Well, maybe they need a little bit of attention. Yeah. Well, you know, the way, maybe they're you, not getting it somewhere else. If you're not nice to yourself, you're not nice to other people. I mean, right. if you think of how people act, I think, you know, you know how critical you are of yourself. When you hear how critical people are of other people, think that that person is really being that critical to themselves. So we need, I think, our society needs to be nicer to ourselves. Well, and that's what I'm saying, that sometimes I think it starts with learning how to how to love yourself first, but people assume that that means that you're being selfish because you're not putting others first. And I'm like, it's, then just think of it as zero. Like, I'm zero, and then other people are one, two, three. Because yeah. if I'm not good to me, I can't be good to others. If I don't get enough sleep, if I don't eat enough, if I don't go to the bathroom, if I don't take care of myself, how can I be present Right. For others. And I, I'm really learning and I'm trying to teach it in a way that I think it's okay to put yourself first. But again, not at the expense of being disrespectful or hurtful or toxic, you know, but, and that's where I think it gets tricky because there are some people that don't know how to do that and they just plow through life with their own needs 100% yeah. all the time. You got to create boundaries though, you know, you got to protect yourself. Hey, yeah. there's a story I read this morning. Can, yes. we, can we move on to this? Yes, dear. Uh, you know, Terry Crews, I love him. Oh, he's, he's he was on actor? Brooklyn Nine Nine, and um, oh. is that what it's called, Brooklyn Nine? I don't know. I don't. Watch, I, don't I like. Well, I binge watch my shows, and I like, yeah. Yeah, don't I don't know the rest yeah. of the shows. Anyway, this guy, and we'll you know. Oh, oh you right, know yeah. And he, he hosts one of the game shows. I don't. I don't know. Anyway, he's been married for twenty five years to his wife, clearly, and they have five <laughs> children. Um, and he, they just went on a ninety day sex fast, which I find interesting, considering they've been married twenty five years and they have five kids. Like. I assume they, they already out. were. Don't they already do that? Five year sex fast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe they should be on a ninety day sex binge. Yeah. But it was ninety <laughs> days, no sex, all relationship, all talk, all cuddle. So for ninety days, um, and he says it, it's like he's more in love with her now than ever. Um, what do you think of that? I first of all think that it's interesting again to the two divorced women in the room. <laughs> I love it. I, think, I, I just feel like I can't judge that because there's something like I'm not understanding what I don't know. You know, like what caused it? What was it? What was the plan? What was their sex life before? What was it? What was the goal? Well, yeah. yeah. What, was they, what were they trying to do? I mean, if they were people who were having, you know, sex for, you know, five days a week, then maybe that, you know, for the last 25 years, <laughs> I, I a think break. that may be a great idea. But if they aren't regularly active, then I may not think it's such a good idea. So I'm going right, to withhold right. judgment something I really do. <laughs> do you know the answers to any of that? No. Does the article I, say that or they just promote the fact that they're more in love now um, than ever? They're more in love and they were just, you know... Who, who wrote this story? Um, <laughs> well, it's a <laughs> reputable source. Yeah. I mean, it's Daily Mail, so... Oh. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, there you go. They were having Case closed. Yeah. And, you know. No, but I just thought it was interesting because the one thing... What, let's just say for argument's sake or for discussion's sake that they do it once a week, right? Now they're not. They can't you know the second that you're forbidden to do something, it's first of all more interesting. But secondly, you know, I think when you've been married a long time, sometimes you just think whenever that person ha- shows any interest in you, it's for that reason. You know what I mean? So, and then you just kind of like, oh, you're just gonna, like, it, they, women shut down sometimes, at least. We, we should have brought, I don't know. We should I, have I brought don't in know. callers for this yeah, one. I'm just, I'm two, just, two I'm, ladies who I'm are. I'm not feeling like that was a good idea. <laughs> I just can't think of a, a scenario where that's a part of intimacy that, and, and unless it, there was like a point of where it was so much. Then right, I have a right. Feeling. Well, if you I watch wonder... Masters of Sex, which I do faithfully, um, they, they do that, that they withhold so that you focus on intimacy in other areas of your life yeah. so that you can build up that the physical part and that the emotional stuff is first and foremost yeah. and the physical just makes it better. I'll which, be ev- taking this information home to my boyfriend. Yeah. Everybody and then you kn- should watch the Masters of Sex. Everybody knows the second you tell me that I can't do something, like I will do it and more than I've ever done it before. So oh. maybe we should okay. try it. Okay, there's a band going on in this room. <laughs> Mr. Jackie. All right. yeah. So when we get, Mr. Jackie, so when we get back, um, we're going to talk the five mistakes people are making in, when it comes to legal issues. With Robin Sachs, we are listening to Broadcast on KHTS. <laughs> It's 
still makes me laugh. <laughs> um, welcome back to Bridescast. We're in studio with Robin Sachs. <laughs> so, with Robin, my emojis. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, now you, you've just opened up the floodgates with me in the bitmojis. So I'm going to show you be, them. I'm like looking at yeah, them. Yeah, be, be wary. Um, so, Robin uh, is a former, I'm just quoting this right from your bio, um, so I don't ruin it. By the way, uh, this is a new website. This is like the fact that you have this beautiful. printed out. It's just been redone. So, launching robinsacks.com. A yeah, little yeah. shout out to myself. Yeah, yeah I love it. Good, um, good. That's on our website. Website awesome. too, and um, people can follow you on Twitter. That's also on our on our website. Um, you are a former um, LA County Deputy District Attorney. Um, you uh, focused, I think, on child sexual sexual assault division, correct? Yes, for the for the mo for the bulk of my career. I mean, I was in Riverside County, LA County, did the whole gamut. You know, murders, robberies, burglaries, thefts, all that kind of stuff. Right. But, but for the bulk most part for the sexual most part? assault child sexual assault domestic violence right okay stalking um and then uh and you've been on networks like abc and nbc and cnn and cbs and morning shows and radio as a legal analyst and what i loved um, it's that probably you wrote, easier to list where she hasn't been because right. it's like two places <laughs> but what i loved in some of the stuff that i read about you is why you became an attorney oh god it's so embarrassing why it's the best thing because you have a big mouth <laughs> i, I love that that was it the is. reason <laughs> i did my, because my like mom to told me yes yeah. i wanted to be a teacher actually and my mom and then this was, I was like 13 years old. And I'm like, I want to be a teacher. I used to have like my stuffed animals and a chalkboard in my room. And my friend, Nicole, I used to make do homework and all that kind of stuff. And my mom, and I'd fight with my mom all the time. My mom's like, you know what? You can get paid for that big mouth of yours. And I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I love it's it. funny. I wanted I love to be it. an attorney in ninth grade. And my brother's like, oh, please. Someone would argue one case against you and you'd cry. <laughs> And so amazing. I cried and I gave it up. Isn't it amazing <laughs> how those little impressions from when you're young? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, so thank you for being here today. So, um, Jackie, do you have a do you have a question? Someone came in, or do we just go in right in? Um, let's start in. But we did have some. I mean, if you have a question, six six one two nine eight five four eight seven. I do have a few. How are you um, supposed to remember that number? Say it slower. Six six one two nine eight five four eight seven. Like I'm on the freeway pulling over, hitting a wall as you're trying to <laughs> <Right>. say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. I I, I do appreciate that because I probably say it like every time. So um, we do have some questions, but let's first go into um, people are making a lot of mistakes when it comes to legal like what what are we doing wrong how do we how is it that we look at the law and how do we have it all wrong well i think it's a it, there's a philosophical problem out there i mean there's this feeling of and it's and it happened just today actually i got a phone call from someone friend of mine in vegas who called me and he feels wronged and so his first response is you know i already called it was it has to do with a car being in the auto shop too long or whatever and he goes i already sent him a letter that the car dealership a letter that they they're gonna have to deal with my lawyer i'm like whoa 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 let's see first you know one of the biggest mistakes people make is one is that they automatically mm -hmm. threaten legal action and I am personally not a fan of making a threat and not coming through with it. So right. if you're going to threaten legal action, you better have a complaint ready and you better plan on filing it because otherwise you're going to not be taken seriously. So I think we're too j quick to jump to the answer to disputes as to being in the legal system. The legal system is costly, slow, and unfair. Mm. And I think that if there's there are other ways to resolve things. Sometimes cases need to go through the legal system, but it's not exactly um, the way people think. And I think that kind of parlays into some of the other issues, which is there's this belief of how cases should be. People like go to mommy and me or go to the park and think that's how every divorce case is right. going to be. <laughs> or they, you know, they watch a little bit of, you know, Nancy Grace and think that's what's going to be in a criminal court. Or you go, you know, and you have a, a, a will or a trust case and you think, oh, this is what's going to happen. People don't know. You have to know the culture of what's really going on. Well, I love that people watch like, um, you know, these law and order and, you know, which I love those shows, but it doesn't happen like like that you know the the in, the crime happens the investigation happens the indictments happen the trial happens and every within 45 minutes right and I, I love that, that system I know <laughs> we wish and by the way that's what jurors and everyone's think, though. But, but by the way and that's what jurors think and jurors think that you're gonna like have this great story and you know and then someone's gonna come into the back room back of the courtroom and say I did it and you have that moment <laughs> right that doesn't happen that's never happened do, do you think that that makes it difficult for attorneys when they're actually in court trying to litigate when you have um, you know the NCISs and all these shows that try to purport what 
the legal system and what you know investigators are actually going through does that make it difficult for you to do your job listen i'll tell you from both as a prosecutor and as a defense attorney now if you go to any seminar for practicing criminal law there will undoubtedly be a section or a class or a speaker speaking about what's called the csi effect which is not only the expectations of what science and the role of science but it also talks about the fact that juries are you have to deal with the television aspect of the justice system because our jurors have that expectation based on it. So you can't ignore, even though I'm saying that's crazy and it's ridiculous, you have to immediately demystify that when you're picking a jury. But does it have an effect on a regular everyday basis? No, because 99% of the stuff that happens in court does not happen in front of a jury. Mm -hmm. Right. It's very few cases actually go to a jury trial. So yes, you have to deal with the television there, but no, no, you know, you don't go to court and have the judge and the two attorneys and the parties think that it's going to, well, the parties do, but not necessarily the, the legal professionals think it happens that way. Huh. Okay. All right. Well, then that just debunked my whole myth. So. No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it, but but it does. It, and it's at its most important yeah. in a jury trial. But the reality is, is even in the criminal justice system, at least, and I can speak for Los Angeles County, I would say only about. 10 to 12 percent of the cases go to trial yeah so you're talking about people dealing with what should happen now i'll tell you along those lines what people expect to be the outcome on a case is that the, the expectations out there are crazy you know from a for example from a criminal defense point of view people think well if i'm going to hire a criminal defense attorney then that means that they should get me off Right. And it's like, well, it depends about what the facts are. I mean, yes, you can look for all the ways to get off. It doesn't necessarily mean just because you have a lawyer, you're going to get off. People don't understand that, you know, I wasn't there when you were drinking and then getting in the car and driving. All I can do is try to mitigate and make sure that the system did what it was supposed to do mm -hmm. when they were arresting you and making sure that the system was doing what it's supposed to do when they're prosecuting you and making sure the cops did what they were supposed to do. But if you had 10 drinks and you're a point two zero. Uh, and everyone did their job correctly to think that I'm going to be the miracle worker to get you off right. is an right. insane right. Uh, perspective. Try not drinking that much before you get behind the wheel. Well, right. Or <laughs> making sure and, and holding the system accountable. I mean, if they didn't administer the test properly or if you – I. I frankly like if you didn't do it and you're there's a claim of innocence then I understand but if you're calling me and saying yeah I did do this now get me off it's like okay where are you gonna take responsibility here right I have a warped view right now of the legal system because I faithfully watch how to get away with murder and I'm just assuming you're all just burying bodies and hiding murders from each other whether it's literal or you know figurative but you know well, well, and and, there, and, and it, the system's yeah. not necessarily fair. I mean, there's you have to understand, like, the culture, for example, in family court right now. For years and years and years and years, there was a presumption that if you got divorced, the woman would get custody, mm -hmm. uh, the, the men would have very small amount of visitations, and dads would have to pay big bucks to the the spouse or to the wife. Now, because of all those years of the women's the default to the woman, the father's rights movement, who have been very active, very prolific, and very loud, have successfully gotten courts to now swing the other way. And right. now if you go into courts, there is, first of all, not only is there a presumption of 50-50 custody, but there is going to be more of a chance that the woman is going to get ruled against her than the really? man will. Yes. Why? Because they're just trying to prove a point? Because there's more of a forgiveness for men. And men, there's a belief that men should not be penalized. Right. And I think, frankly, actually, from a philosophical point of view, I agree with that. I think that's a good thing. I think that kids need both their mom and their dad in their life. But it shouldn't be a mom versus dad and who the gender is analysis. It's right. who the person is, who the people are, who's, who's acting in the best interest of the children. The other thing that's happening in courts is that while a lot of people, especially women who have been bullied potentially by men in their past, feel like, I'm going to now stand up for myself. I'm not taking it one more minute. I'm going to fight, fight, fight. Well, that philosophy can blow up in the family court because the family courts like the likes the party that's most Amenable. easy to get along, mm -hmm. you know, get along to go along kind of thing. And the mm -hmm. courts like those people because they don't want the squeaky wheels. And so the squeaky wheels are not getting as much of a benefit as the other parents. So there's this oh. belief that I need to be a fighter and I need to come in blazing. And it's like, no, actually the person who's most reasonable, most calm, most willing to work through a situation, most seemingly most compromising is probably going to do much better. Mm -hmm. On that note, we do have yeah. a question from uh, one of our 
listeners who did not want to be identified, but she is uh, recently separated and she wants to know, you know, she hasn't filed for divorce yet. What does she need to know before moving down that path? Well, so separation is kind of an interesting thing. So someone told me, called me and said, hey, listen, I'm thinking about getting separated. This date of separation in California is a big deal. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think that the date that you've actually decided is when you all of a sudden are now no longer considered a marriage and you're no longer considered a community. So if those people out there right now, if you're sitting here thinking that you want to get separated, there are ramifications for that. One is about support, child support and spousal support. Spousal mm -hmm. support is presumed to begin on the date of separation. And if you don't immediately get some sort of either orders or arrangement in place, then you are losing what could be the status quo. Because what the courts look at in terms of setting the amount of support out there is they're looking to see how much money do you need to live. Spousal support and child support is not supposed to be a windfall. It's not supposed to be this is the money you get as a consolation prize. Right. It's supposed to be this is the money you need to live in order to maintain your standard of living. So if you are separating right away, mm -hmm. you need to immediately make sure you are getting what would be the approximate amount that you would be getting in support. And you don't need a lawyer necessarily to do that you can run it you can it's done through a computer program you but you want to take something because every Just minute you do the distance master is your friend if well. you don't if you don't take money then it's very hard mm. later on saying i need money and then the judge is going to say well, well you lived you? all these months without right. it and why didn't you come into court asking for it right. to file something right yeah. so and sometimes people feel guilty and so they're like, no, that's okay. You just take everything. And it's guilt. It's very hard to yeah. recover from that. Right. Yes. By the way, guilt it, yeah. is don't feel guilty or and or use guilt, the guilt of the other party, because that guilt is one of my favorite tools as a family lawyer <laughs> in terms of being able to use it to your benefit. The other thing is, is I would recommend anybody who is thinking about separation. If you are going to move out of the house, you do not leave your house without your children. Uh, because there can be an argument that's made that you have abandoned, you abandoned your uh, children. And yeah. so and do either you have a custody order, and you don't have to have a court order necessarily. You can have an agreement between you and the, the Just written the out. Written out something, but something that is an agreement that you are not abandoning. Because if you're like, listen, I'm leaving, and you leave for the weekend, and all of a sudden there's an argument that you've abandoned. I didn't know that when wow. I filed for my separation that an automatic restraining order went into place, because I thought restraining order means against physical harm, but it actually yeah. locked up all of our funds. That's called atros there's immediately oh, right. uh, okay. there, there are temporary restraining orders that are automatically well, upon the filing of divorce that makes it so that you cannot drain any bank accounts you can't right. change any life insurance policies you can't change any wills those automatically go in effect however what I would recommend to any party, if you think you're going to be the one filing, I, you are entitled to 50% of whatever is in a bank account prior to filing for divorce, right, uh, right. like the day before. I would go into the account, pull out 50% of everything, and th and get take whatever liquid is there. Um, and even your secret accounts, by the way, people, they're entitled to the other 50%. Mm. <laughs> and get, get whatever you need so that you have that, and then file, because then you can do that. Wow. Sounds, you know, I, I, so I like remember one of the best pieces of advice I received when I was going through my divorce is that I had to think of it like a business dissolution. And that was really hard because, you know, Jackie, you touch on about guilt and emotions. That really gets in the way. And I remember, you know, hiking up hours with my attorney because I was so emotionally charged about things and I felt so wronged by what was happening. And then at some point I'm like, wait, this is just a business. This is just money. This is just property. Mm. And then it became much easier for me to be making smarter decisions. But when I let my emotions drive my litigation, it it hurt me um, right. because I was the one that had the guilt because I was the one that asked for it. So in the beginning, I'm like, oh, just everything. I just wanted to make it work. And I just, whatever we want to just get it done and just be nice to each other. And then I'm like, wait, I'm being totally taken advantage of. And it wasn't about getting more. It was just about making it equal and fair and as copacetic as we could, but then emotions took over on both parts and it just got really cloudy for a long time. There's also a lot of phases to the process. That's the other thing. And what, and what people don't realize is what they feel on the day that they're thinking, I mean, first of all, there's all those divorce curious people out there who are listening, hopefully, or not, <laughs> uh, to, to, who are kind of uh -huh. like, I want to know what I need to do. I know that this isn't working. That was me. Like, in, I, First of all, I separated from my husband in 2006. We got back together. And when we got back together, and by the time 2009 hit, I knew that it wasn't going to work. But I also knew that I wasn't ready in 2009 to get divorced. It took me till 2012 to finally separate. And so wow. I think that a lot of there's a lot of mental preparation that needs to happen. I yeah. think, I mean, one of the things that I think that people, we don't take enough 
time to think about is a lot of people kind of say, oh, divorce is the easy way out. Baloney. Yeah. <laughs> it is so hard. It is so emotional. It is, it, you know, I kind of look at uh, divorces like getting um, tattoos. It's like, you know, 25 bucks and a beer to put on and thousands of dollars <laughs> and a lot of emotional pain to take it off. That's what, that, that's yeah. what a divorce is. Right? A marriage is like, a, it's a nice little party, a few thousand bucks and boom, you're married, happy, whatever. And it's lifetime of ripping out your heart and guts <laughs> and being broken down and, and, and it's, and it's awful. Yeah. yeah. And people really change during that process. You know, people, well, you kind of see their true colors too, right? Yeah. I mean, what do they say? It's like hot water, so either oh, I don't know. I don't, don't ruin this. Don't yeah, let, quote. Let, let's move on. Okay. So um, let's go back to the five mistakes that okay. people are making because I want to make sure because um, we've promised them on our website. So let's yeah. let's. Well, those were a couple who were mushed in there. Yeah. Well, you did <laughs> one. You talked about um, that uh, your clients, you know, think that you should just get them off. So one of the things that you said was that most litigants think it's the lawyer's job to do all the work. That litigants need to look at the relationship as a partnership. Well, that right. So that when I say that is that, and in particular, actually, in divorce cases, in criminal cases, any kind a case the client you the litigant the person whose case it is has more information about the case than the lawyer is going to have mm -hmm. and so sometimes people believe kind of and they look at this in terms of the value for their dollar so they figure okay I'm giving this a lot of money to a lawyer they should just do everything right but the problem is is that the lawyer, no matter how great they are, has not lived your life, has not lived your situation, was not there when the incident happened, didn't own your car if it was an accident, didn't, wasn't there on the day of the accident, all those kinds of things. So you need to expect to be part of doing the legwork. Right. I mean, if you're going through a divorce, you are the only person who knows where all the accounts are. You are the only person who knows how much money you spent. You are the only person who knows what sex was like in that marriage. You're the only person who knows those things. And so the litigants need to be prepared to participate, to give information, to have to write statements, to have to write facts. I mean, I know that there are clients out there who would think, well, why do I have to do all the writing if I'm paying you to be the writer? No, you need to make sure that me, I, as your lawyer, have everything that's in your head and needs to be transmuted into my head so that I can know what you felt, saw, and are going through. Okay. So, you know, be a partner. The other, the, the first one was not just jump into it, right? Right. Um, the most expensive move someone will make is hiring a free lawyer. Oh, yes. I wanted, I, I yes. read that. Tell, yes. The most, is, that. I love this one. This is my <laughs> favorite piece of advice. Everyone, I, I can't tell you how many times I get hit up. I get hit up all the time for people call, coming to me. Like, like I just, just did the hallway. Yeah, yeah. You just did that too. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's cool. And I don't mind giving, um, <laughs> An answer, but this is the thing. The reality is, is if you are asking the advice of a good lawyer, mm -hmm. then they are busy. And the only thing lawyers have is their time to sell. Mm -hmm. And no matter how you cut the cake, there are only 24 hours in a day. Right. So if you are going to help the person who is paying you or help the person who is not paying you, who are you going to put your brain power into? Who are you going to give the best advice to? So if you're not then giving your best advice and you're not doing the best research, then you potentially are costing that person money because right. you're missing things. Right. And so I've, you know, there, I, I've used this example. I know someone who charges, um, he's like $1,200 an hour oh. for wills and trust stuff. He's very, very expensive. Wow. And, um, but, and, but, and I was talking to him and he said, you know, what I tell people, and it's true, is that I'm $1,200 an hour, but I know Someone can call me on the phone and in two seconds I can answer that question on a very complicated thing. Other lawyers who wouldn't have the depth of knowledge he does may charge $400 an hour, but it's going to take him five hours to right. do the amount of research right. that it's going to take me two minutes. Right. So why, my one minute, I'm not going to charge them. So there's this perception of let me hire the cheapest lawyer. No, mm. sometimes hiring the most expensive lawyer is going to get you the best and cheapest results. So people because don't understand in a quicker how the time frame. is right. and how time right. works. And also people who don't aren't busy enough that they need to churn out hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure that people are constantly, you know, going to you, for free and you advice, get so. and you get what you pay for a lot of the times, not every time, but a lot yeah. of the time. We have to go to break, but can you stick around for one more second? I can. Excellent. You're listening to Broadcast with Robin Sachs. Uh, we'll be right back. I Welcome don't. back to Broadcast with Hi. Kim and Jackie. I stay. Robin Sachs. Mm -hmm. She's here. She's here. She's here. And Robin stay too. Thank you. <laughs> so you know, we all know that you know libel, slander, stalking. Things like that are, you know, bad and people have, are held accountable in real life. But now we've moved into the internet where people say and do, it seems, whatever they want. 
Are we starting to get the law to back up that you can't do that anymore? Well, first of all, just like everything when it comes to technology, the real world trails behind. So while technology and innovation happens, uh, there's always, you know, whatever laws that are on the books may not address the newest, latest technology. However, there have been great strides that have been made in terms of um, uh, the, the evolution of law in terms of the internet and, and technology and so forth. But the, the one thing that people don't realize is even if there isn't the evolution of the law, the things that apply in the real world apply on the online world too. I mean, mm -hmm. if you say something false about someone, that's defamation. And Unless slander. you're a public figure, right? Well, well, no, that's a defense. There's okay. defenses to those types of things. But if you say something, and, and there's certainly defenses of whether it's an opinion. I mean, there's certain things. Right. But that same standard is going to apply and can be used on the online world. The one thing that people kind of, I think, have this knee-jerk reaction is everything about online makes everything worse. But from a legal point of view, everything about online can make things worse better as a lawyer because all of a sudden now you have this digital footprint of mm, proof out right, there that right. you never had before. Right. I mean, all I need to do, you know, the first thing I do, I mean, I, a client calls me, I'm like, start screenshotting. Yes. You know, I'm the first right. thing I'm, get on her Facebook account, get on her Instagram account. What is she tweeting about? Who are her friends? Before that stuff goes down, because right. I'll tell you, that's the next piece of advice. That right. stuff goes down. Right. So, you know, you have an opportunity to know more about people than you ever have and both the good and bad that comes with that. So one of the things that I am curious about that. We, you know, between fr freedom of speech with people, I, I can say whatever I want until I, I, but is there a line that gets drawn? I mean, can you say whatever you want until it becomes threatening? Or well, do you have to cite a physical, like a threat to physically harm somebody? I'm like where, I, because I have a lot of people that will call me and ask me, how do I, what do I do? Someone's bullying me online. Someone's, you know, when, when can I, call it cyber stalking when can i call the fbi and say that these threats are legit like what well so there's two worlds right there's the civil world and the criminal world so the first thing is is that you know do you have a civil case or is this something that needs law enforcement intervention and sometimes both systems have to work hand in hand the standard to get a criminal protective order meaning a restraining order or i'm sorry a civil restraining order not a criminal civil restraining order is is hard it's not easy to get a restraining order nowadays just someone saying something i mean you have to actually show that there is a seriousness to the threat that it wasn't said in jest that they they actually have the ability to carry out the threat um, so there, it's very hard to get a civil restraining order. If there is a criminal case, something that mounts to what would be criminal, very often it would be automatic that a criminal restraining order would come from it. But then again, that's the same standard on the criminal side, because on the criminal side, in order for it to be a crime, in order for it to be what's called uh, terrorist threats or right. criminal threats under right. the penal code, is there has to be a threat. It has to be uh, it foreseeable that it actually can be carried out. So usually what does it take to then be able to cross over to where law enforcement will get involved is that it usually has to happen multiple times or it has to increase. Something that starts with a, um, you know, a, a post that then turns into I've showed up at your work. Well, now you're showing that now this person has gone to this next level. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the one thing I think that people make a mistake about is I get so many calls of people calling me and saying, this person's threatening me and this person's been threatening me for a long time and I want to get a restraining order. And I'll say, okay, so when was the last time that the person threatened you? And they'll be like two weeks ago. I'm like, okay, you can't call me. It's not ripe anymore. You can't say I'm scared for my life and not having done anything for right. two weeks. Right. And the courts will look, they, they don't look favorably on that anyway because if you're so scared, why didn't you come in here the day that it happened? That's exactly but I will right. tell you, having unfortunately been in, in, in that situation, it's not that easy to get a restraining order as you said and so sometimes that's the reason because I couldn't get one I couldn't you know but you try yeah you try because then you can say I tried on this date on this date and by the way one of the reasons why people don't get restraining orders is why they don't get issued is because it's very hard to get service on the person that you need to get restrained yeah. you have to mm. get you actually have to serve them they have an opportunity to be heard in court and you you will get a restraining order by default if they've been served and haven't and shown, shown up. It. But if you if they don't know about it or there's no proof of service, you're not going to get a restraining order. So then the amount of work it takes to go – and that's money. It costs people money to hire someone to fi to serve someone. I mean, who wants to go find their stalker and serve them themselves? No one. Do you feel like there's an increase in lawsuits um, filed – with the onset of like the internet and, and social media, do you feel like because people now have become armchair detectives and people have access to so much information that that fires up the litigation train? I think that there is a little bit of a reverse of going what's going on in civil cases primarily in the um, 
in this system right now is I think that there's like the, the person who runs to the courthouse first is usually the person who should be the defendant, but they become the plaintiff. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. Like yeah. I find that there's like a lot of people who like use the, the legal system to stalk people and harass people. Like I have a case that uh, a, a friend of mine actually, she's a lawyer in California, but she lives in North Carolina and she broke up with his boyfriend and he is now filing lawsuits against her everywhere just to really to, as a form of stalking. And so she, he's using yeah. the legal system as a form of stalking. So wow. he's the plaintiff in all these cases and claiming all this baloney junk. I mean, it's not junk, but he's, he's wreaking havoc on her life by being the plaintiff in a lawsuit. So I do think that whenever I see a, oh, you got, you know, I'm, I'm much more sympathetic to the defendant in a civil lawsuit these days. Huh. Interesting. I wouldn't have thought that. Yeah, so I just go ahead, Jackie. I was just, you know, there have been a lot of cyber bullying and and unfortunately suicides and you know young kids. I mean, home used to be that safe place that where you'd get away from all the drama and the BS that happens at school, and now it just follows you home. You know, and and you know before some of these tragedies happen, is there something that kids or parents of kids can do to stop? other kids from kind of cyberbullying or, I mean, obviously, other than cancel all your accounts and not be on? Well, the first recommendation I have is parents, you don't need a warrant. You don't need permission. You need to snoop on your kids' phones and on their devices, and you need to know what they're saying and mm. who they're saying things to. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, I mean, I'm not saying that you need to do this on a daily basis, but you need to spot check and know what your kids are saying and who what they're Absolutely. saying and what kids what's being said to them so that you can have meaningful conversations about that stuff. And I think you have to open up the conversations. I don't think that there's one size fits all on how to fix all of this, but I think that you need to be aware, you need to be listening, um, you need to, to know what your kids are doing, who they're talking to, that you need to monitor their um, website and social media and, and electronic use. I mean, I think that the amount of time that you allow your kids to be on devices needs to be greatly limited and controlled. I think mm -hmm. phones should be charged in a common area right. so that, that you know that there's downtime on those devices, mm -hmm. um, those kinds of things. Well, taking that one step further, are there things that adults can do to advocate for ourselves so that we don't find ourselves in litigious situations? Like we put a, a question out to our listeners, like, do you read contracts? Do you know what your HOA says? Do you read the bank statements? No, and the fine no, print? Like, and no. Oh my <laughs> gosh, Robin. I'll be the first to tell you, I've bought several houses, uh, cars, adopted a child. I read nothing. I know. Well, there's, there's, there's actually a little bit of a defense to that because, okay, so you know how there's some, I've adopted, I don't you know, know. You know how there's some um, contracts where you have to like initial at the lines yes. or whatever? Those are the reason that they have those little initials is to make sure that you're reading them as you go along because there is a defense that if, oh, this is this long thing with itty bitty writing, you're not going to necessarily read everything and you may not be held accountable for everything and that could be a defense to a contract. Uh, but yes, I mean one of the number one things that people come to me and they'll say, oh, can I sue blah 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 and, and I sign this contract and I said, what does the contract say? Because the first thing you it's need so to It's so hard to you read. Need, you need, the first <laughs> thing is, I mean when it says and you are waiving all of your rights and this case will be settled by our mandatory arbitration and you may not file a lawsuit. Well, now, guess what? You only way to settle that case is through arbitration or at least you have to start and that first. Unless state. you're yes. trying to invalidate the contract, which is a whole other thing. So basically right. people need to read and not sign blindly. Yeah, and you know what you can also do? I'm a big fan of crossing things out in contracts that I don't like. Mm. So if you sign a contract, like I'll just like redline it myself and you just sign it and then initial, initial, initial where you did it, like that, because then it becomes, it's a counter offer back and it's, and if they don't, and if they let it go and that's what it is, then that's the contract. Right, right. Oh, well, that's that. good. That's timing. it. End of our show. Wow. Robin that was fast. Thank you so much for joining us. And Thank you for having me. You can me. find Robin on Robin's, Twitter yeah. at Robin Sachs, robinsachs.com. The new website. Yes, the new website. Looks amazing. Thank and you. all of your books, we put them on our website too. You have six books that you've written, but we listed <laughs> them on our website and people can find them awesome. um, there. And thank you, Robin, always thank for you. being such a good advocate for Thanks, victims and Roz. survivors and all that stuff too. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Thank you.